Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So a number of years ago, I wanted to put in a garden, a fresh garden in a spot along the back fence um, in, in our yard in, in our house in South Carolina. And so I dug it and I turned it over with a shovel and, and, I, and I built these string trellises that go went up the fence. We had a six foot fence and, uh, and I planted beans all along the fence. And, you know, it doesn't take long for beans to pop up and they grew and they started climbing and I wove them in so that they would climb on those strings and they grew several feet high. And then one morning I came out and I don't know what it was, but right about an inch above the ground on every stem, all the way down the line, some animal ate about that much of it. So I had all of the, what I'll call the branches above and all of that stubby vine at the bottom and nothing in between. Well, the sun comes up and, you know, it's 100 degrees there and they start drying up right away. You know, I guess I could have tried to water them some more. I could have tried taping them together. I could have tried to encourage them to, to do something. I could have yelled at them Beans grow! But you know the result. Nothing was going to change. They were dead because they were no longer connected to that main stem. Branches neither survive nor do they thrive unless they are connected to a healthy vine. From this, we also see that that there is a twofold need for us to be connected to our vine, Jesus. That is, so that we may survive and then we may also thrive, that is, produce fruit. We can look at these things in, in more traditional, say, churchly language, Lutheran words that we understand. To, to survive, to live, or as Jesus says, to abide, we might say is our justification. That is, this is we who stand right before God on account of faith in all that Jesus has done for us. And then that other side, that thriving that I'm talking about, the bearing of fruit, that is the sanctification. That is the life that we live to the glory of God the way in which we do love him and love our neighbor. Now, I'm going to mix my metaphors here a little bit. But I want to look at this from another angle, if you will. And it's based on our study. And I know this is the second week in a row I've talked about our Romans Bible study. But we hit another sticky point in chapter 13 on Wednesday night, verse 14 in particular. There Paul writes, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Here Paul, he's writing to Christians. He's writing to people that already believe, who have already been baptized. But he's telling us to do just what we read in the small catechism. He's telling us to daily put on Christ, to live in that baptism. He's saying, abide, live in Christ. And so this is how the Christian does live. The Christian lives from the weekly celebration of the divine service where Jesus himself is uniquely present among us and there where we receive the privileges of baptism, our absolution, that acceptance, if you will, into the very presence of God this is where you picture that you are in that throne room with God because Jesus is here with you. And you know that as you speak here, as you sing here, that there is an ear listening, the very ear of God who desires to hear your prayers. But here where you come to hear the word and that assurance of his grace and to receive the body and blood of our mind. The central part of the life of, of the Christian, as the Christian abides in Jesus. But that is not the end-all, be-all of everything. It is a daily life 
to put on Christ as a daily experience of living in our holy baptism, taking advantage, if you will, of the things that the vine gives to us, the privilege of hearing his word speak to us daily as we read our devotions, as we perhaps do a little study. And now, as we got a couple of Bible studies going during the week, and as we call upon God in prayer. We take advantage, that is, we make use of the means for abiding that are provided to us in Christ. And so any branch that is to be healthy, any branch that is to be a producer of fruit, must first be alive. It must be connected to the vine. It must be a receiver of all that makes it healthy and have in abundance that nourishment that is needed in order to produce fruit. So as Jesus speaks of vines and branches, right, or the vine and the branches, we recognize that he is referring to a vineyard, right? He's talking about the production of grapes. Now, not that we're all to go out and become, you know, vineyard owners and raise grapes, but he's using a concept that of agriculture that everybody already understands so that we might apply it to ourselves. So let's take it one step further. I grew up in high school just over the hills from Napa Valley. You go over there and the vineyards are beautiful. They're gorgeous. But its purpose, if you will, is not to be beautiful. The purpose of a vineyard is to produce grapes. So as a vine dresser would remove an unhealthy branch from the vine, would remove an unproductive branch. So too, Jesus says, the Father takes away what I'll call here the pseudo-Christians, those that say that they are Christians but are truly not. He takes away all those that do not bear fruit. And those that do bear fruit, he prunes so that they might be more productive. Now here Jesus speaks not of our justification, He's not talking specifically about our abiding, but it's something that stems from our abiding. It stems from our justification, and that is our sanctification, our good works, our holy living in this world. That which follows being justified in Christ. So I want to take a look at each one of these. That is the, the lopping off, if you will, and the pruning. The first instance is where the Father removes those branches that bear no fruit. Perhaps this is the individual that was baptized at some point in their life, but refused to believe. Maybe attended as long as they were forced to be in church, but escaped as soon as the opportunity came along. It could be the one who, who was confirmed, knew all the Words, right? He knew how to answer the questions, but never truly believed. And so drifted away soon after confirmation. It could be the one that perhaps suffered a severe hardship in his life. He decided it was better to blame God and to run away than to accept even that it was the result of his own sin. It could even be the one that sits in the pew every week and has done so all of his life, but never learns to love, never learns to joyfully give, or to be freely uh, or to offer freely anything to anybody, that never learns to help without expecting payment or, or never learns to really have concern for another and have true charity. It is the one who simply makes a pretense at being a Christian, but whose heart is actually cold. To this one, there are many admonitions in Scripture. St. Peter's epistle comes to mind in his second uh, letter. He, he encourages there the brothers 
to be all the more diligent in making their call and their election sure by producing the fruit of faith, by living in virtue and godly living. So far, I'll touch on the first one, that of being locked off, if you will. Let's look at the second one, that of being pruned. The second instance here is in which Jesus speaks to the sanctification of the Christian, if you will, those who do produce fruit. These the Father prunes that they would bear more fruit. Now, you may not know how to prune. I don't really know how to prune well, right? But we all understand that there's a branch here or there, whether it's a fruit tree, whether it's a vine that comes off. Grapevines, they kind of at the end trim them all off, and that's not really what Jesus is talking about. But imagine if that branch or that tree could actually feel what was going on. It would hurt. Pruning hurts. It's often painful. Not just for the, those non-living things, but for us as we are pruned by God. It's oftentimes not the things that we desire, none of the things that we would be seeking after. And in often, I would say it's even the things that we are really trying to avoid. But such pruning does its work. It calls us to repentance because God is probably pruning off that sinful aspect of our lives. Painful because he's maybe attaching something else there that will draw us closer to him. It is a realigning oftentimes of our lives where, where our personal goals, our individual passions, our very idols are being done away with by God. So that our lives will be more focused outward. Focused towards God, that is loving God, and focused towards our neighbor, loving our neighbor. As we abide in Jesus, the Father is pruning. He's pruning us that our abiding itself would be more secure and that our fruit would be more abundant. You know, there's other places in Scripture that talk about this, I would say, in different language than pruning. Such as a father who disciplines his son. It is the vine dresser doing his work to make those branches healthy and to make them more productive. Now, if we were to ask, well, what is my fruit supposed to look like, right? So how am I going to know if I'm really producing good fruit? Well, we would measure this, if you will. We would gauge it. We would judge it in the same way that we would judge our sin by looking at the Ten Commandments. As we look to God's word and the commandments that he gives to us, it exposes to us our sin so that we would repent. But it guides us. It leads us along so that we might have a clear understanding on how God does desire us to love him and to love our neighbor. How we are or what kind of fruit that we are supposed to produce according to our own individual vocations, according to our places in life where we are and the relationships that we have. I guess I can, I can point to a couple of things that we corporately produce good fruit. One is this coming ABBA banquet where we have participated for several years now in supporting ABBA, a women's resource center here in Portland, but by supporting them, supporting the lives of children giving opportunity to mothers who are terrified or scared or, or are being cornered by others to do that which we would find unconscionable and giving opportunity for those children to live fruitful and productive lives. Also, this year, um, the Mercy Committee has also been providing for us opportunities, if you will, to give alms to different ministries different mercy opportunities, this month being the, the homeless um, youth, what is it, the homeless youth services of South Port. Small ways, but ways in which we love, even those neighbors, let's say, that we don't really know, that are a little bit distant from us. But we do know that pruning is painful oftentimes. 
And so oftentimes it's seen, if you will, as an attack against us. It's, it's seen by us as an evil that falls upon us. And I would say that there are things right now in our lives that I would not hesitate to say or put in, in our view that we would understand God is using those things to prune us. Things that could be natural, that is, they just occur naturally. It's things that, that are invented, let's say, even by human beings, but things even sometimes that appear miraculous. But even many things that we would actually pin on the devil. Say that those things are devilish as they, as they attack us in, in our lives. But God uses them all. Just look at our current pandemic, right? It's something that I would say God is using to prune us. As it is giving us an opportunity to face this unseen um, enemy, if you will. It seems to lurk behind every bush, but to face it with the confidence of the gospel, that, that through faith in Jesus Christ, God does not abandon us, and that we live, even in the midst of such a danger, without fear. You know, we can blame all kinds of things for our current pandemic. We can blame others, and we can blame circumstances. We can blame nature. But I would say still that God is using it to prune us so that we might bear good fruit, the fruit of faith in Christ and love towards our neighbor. So I'm going to use another example, and this will lead into my last portion of the sermon. As I look around, I mean, we, we vary in age in some fashion greatly. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't long ago I could talk about my grand, grandparents, right? Going from horse and buggy to having an automobile to even living to, to an age of computers. And we talk about how much has changed. But look how much has changed in the way people think today. How our society has changed. How, how I don't even know how to describe it sometimes. But over the last decade especially, it's, 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 it's reached an exponential change uh, curve that is almost apocalyptic. It's very tumultuous. It is not something that most of us desire. It is not something that we would attribute to God. But certainly, I would say God is using it to prune us. So that in the midst of this, we could produce good and abundant fruit. If being canceled, let's say, means that we are being recognized as being faithful to God, what a wonderful witness. What a wonderful way to actually love our neighbor, to stick, that is, to the truth of the way things truly are. If being called a bigot or accused of any kind of phobia against something or whatever that's contrary to God's word, if that is the result of our faithfulness to God's word, then I would say our fruit is evident for all to see. And the only way that we can produce such fruit, that is the fruit of faithfulness in, in the word of God that we speak, and in the word of God that, that shapes our lives, is by actually abiding in the vine. Only by abiding in Jesus can we be faithful to Jesus in all aspects of life. So our text from John speaks to the what of who we are and to the why for the things that we are to do in this life. It speaks clearly to the struggle that, that we've been having, I would say, corporately as a congregation, just trying to develop a mission statement, to, to come together with a purpose statement for the things that, that, uh, that we do or what, which we try to do outside of the context of the divine service and the direction that we are seeking for the ministry that has been entrusted to us. It describes for us the what of who we are. 
That is, that we are the branches that abide in the vine. And described in another way, then, I, it came to my mind in the 8 o'clock service that we're, we are to be chips off the old block. Little Christs that abide and dwell in the word that is given to us. But it also speaks to the why of the things that we do and the purpose for producing fruit. We do these things. That is, our fruit is to make sure, in one aspect, our calling and our election, as Peter described. It is the evidence, if you will, of our faith. It is also to bear witness to the world of the gospel in the very things that we say and the things that we do. But it is also, there's another aspect to it, and that is that, that we would learn to settle aside our individual life's ambitions, our goals, our passions, if you will, for the sake of those neighbors that are probably closest to us. And here I'm going to use the example of a commercial that I heard advertised on a podcast that I listened to. I haven't heard it in some time. It's narrated by the pastor of a, a Lutheran congregation that has a school. And I think it does bring home the point for us of the fruit that is to be a part of our lives and our congregation. In it, the pastor made the point that if you had no good options where you currently live for your children's education, let's say, other than the public school, that I would say, in many ways, is the doctrine of Antichrist. Everything that it teaches, especially today, as it undermines the family teaches children to disobey and disrespect their parents and teaches them not or actually to, to hate Christ because it dispels and does away with the very gospel. Now with the wokeness of our culture and, and everything else that's going on, they've taken it to a whole new level down to kindergarten, and now the proposal from three-year-olds on up, mandatory. His solution then is that you should probably sell your house. You should quit your job, and you should move, his answer, near him. Because there you have the word in the sacrament, and it's truth and purity. And you have a nurturing Lutheran school which will teach your children to love Christ. So I'm trying to pick up where I was here, but the purpose then, what he was pointing out is, how is it that you love your neighbor who is closest to you, that is your children. And you provide for your children, for their faith, that they might abide in Christ. And that they too might uh, produce fruit. I'll even add the words of Jesus to this here. Jesus says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul. Is there anything more important? Is there anything anywhere near as important than abiding in Jesus? Apart from him who is life, we have no life. Apart from him who is the good work of God, or he who is the good work of God, we can produce no good works. Apart from the vine, the branches do not live, and they do not produce fruit. 
But because he lives, we live. Because he is fruitful, we are fruitful. Our very being is to be found in him as we abide in him. And so our lives are to be lived in him. That is, in another way, our lives are to be lived in service to others. Just as he has lived in service to us. And his promise to us is that if we do abide in him, then he abides in us. And his good work, the good work that he has done, shall bring us to the fullness of our eternal salvation. So to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we can even ask or think, according to the power that is actually at work in us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever.